I'm Lance Phillips in full-blown Grey Cup hangover mode. I know exactly what the Beast Boys meant when they said, no sleep till Brooklyn. I'm Chris King and I'm taking a lot of happiness in Lance's misery today. <laughs> it's not misery, dude. I'm elated today. It looks like misery right Does now. Does it? I, I feel like happy. I've been put through a meat grinder, for sure. If I saw you walk in the streets, I wouldn't think twice. No, but <laughs> just off me? Yeah, just walking put randomly. This, put this man out of his misery kind of thing. What's that guy doing over there? Listen, if you haven't been to a Grey Cup, you must go. Lance Phillips, Chris King with you after the gloves are off. The Grey Cup is unbelievable. Bucket list, I think. I think I have to go no, now. It, You've pumped it up enough. It's incredible, and that's my first one. I've been a CFL fan since I was a kid, and that, that was honestly the, one of the most incredible things I've ever been to. Purely Canadiana. Canadiana? It's purely Canadiana. Did every other person leave that building in the same shape as you? Yes, for Argos sure. fans for sure did. For sure, for sure, all six of them. Screaming, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about it because. Yeah, we're gonna get into it, but there was, there was some significant football games beyond the Grey Cup locally that happened on the weekend. We'll get started with that. The Lloyd Tom Barons, the Holy Rosary Raiders. Friday night was the Holy Rosary Raiders losing a heartbreaker to the Cochrane Cobras 21-14, followed up Friday morning by a 21-0 Foothills Falcons win over the Lloyd Comp Barons. Chris, can you consider these two teams' seasons a success given these Alberta Bowl losses? Yeah, I think you have to take it as a success. They're the top two teams. But they didn't win a championship. Yeah, not every team wins a championship. I know that we talked odds Toronto Argonauts before. won a championship. For sure they did. Anyway, sorry. It I, was their championship, their time. <laughs> Going back to the high school football, they're the top two teams in Alberta in their tier. And I think that's something really special. We talked about a little last week in terms of Lloydminster football really blowing up. So we had the number two team in tier two and tier three. I think it's a great season. You now, just said it, number two. Number they were number one. Yeah, and only one team gets to be number one every year. That's, that's the thing. So of all the high school football teams, one team wins it. Right? I'm hammering away here. I'm hammering away, but, but I, I am going to agree with you on this, that these are successful seasons, more so for the comp barons. That was an extremely successful season that they had. I believe that if you were to ask Holy Rosary, they're super disappointed that they couldn't beat those guys. I think I believe that's a third straight loss to right. the Cochran Cobas. And, and that would be frustrating for them. I still deem that season a success. They're still, they're still one of the top teams in this province perpetually, every year they are. Um, in that that's pretty successful what the Barons did. Well, I mean, nobody expected them to beat Grand Prairie. Nobody. No, and, and end of the day, you play for a championship, but you don't always get to play in a championship game. And I think the fact that the comp was in the championship game, as you said, it's a feather in their cap. For Holy, their goal is a little bit different right now. They've been there enough times that right. now they want to win it, and they want to win it every year. So the, the I get that. Then the interesting thing about Rosary is I feel like Rosary's road to the Alberta Bowl is easier than the comps is. The comp has some tougher teams to play against. Rosary rolled through St. Albert. I mean, they crushed them basically on the way there. I mean, there's not a ton of competition for Holy Rosary beyond the Wheatland Football League until they get to Alberta Bowl. Right, and as we talked about last week, maybe it's the Wheatland Football League Wheatland Football League that's getting our guys ready and maybe that's why Holy was so strong. Well, and Red match. Dogs. And Red Dogs is for sure. Yeah. The wrestlers women's basketball and volleyball teams hit the semester break. Both teams are currently sitting in first place right now in their conference. Lance, give us the grades on these teams for the first half of the first year. First of all, are you going to grade these teams? Oh, I'll grade them, yeah. You're going to grade the women's basketball I team? I will grade It better not be an A+, I'll tell you it's, right now. It's definitely not. Let's start with volleyball. Okay. Um, volleyball, <laughs> you, you can't go anywhere but A+. Yep. They are 12-0. and 0. They started the season exactly where they left off. They've been the number one ranked team in, in the Canadian Athletic Association, yep. Canadian College Athletic Association, all season to this point. There's realistically nobody that can stop this team. Yeah, like They're it, better. <laughs> They're yeah. better. Yeah, and that's one of those things when you go into a season like this, your focus is on little details because you know you're better every single For night. Sure. So when I see like Augustana grab a game off them, I think, okay, maybe the girls lost focus. Maybe we're getting some players in the game, but ultimately my grade for them, A plus. They are sure. where they should be and they might not get tested until they see Briarcrest in the conference finals. Well, and so this is the stiffest test for them, I believe. I, I believe Briarcrest may, Briarcrest ranking, I believe was number five. Yeah. Uh, and I believe that they're probably a top three team in Canada. Yeah. I, I think their rank, ranking is actually low. And unlike the, the Russell's women's basketball team, the women's uh, volleyball team are well coached. Yeah. They're very well That's coached. True. That's true. I've heard things <laughs> that the men's, the women's basketball coach might be gone at the end of this year. So. I would not doubt it's that. It's happened before. <laughs> Hot seat is always happening for me. 
Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> I think they're well coached. The team is deeper. They're much, much deeper than they were last year. Yep. They've got some great rookies out there. Um, their starting group is, I mean, what else can you say? Yeah, they're, they're fantastic. A- and the confidence, you can see their swagger right now is, yes. is at a high. They know they're sure. good. They're playing well. Even when they make mistakes, they overcome them. So. Uh, quickly on women's basketball, uh, great play from some freshmen. Caitlin Tanita, uh, Bailey Johnson, who we've talked about as an athletic beast. Uh, even Jaden Coco, they should miss some time. Right. It's been good. I know that you said you thought you were getting good work out of your bigs. I feel like they've been very inconsistent. Right. And I feel like they need to be tougher in the paint. And, and this is your team's issue. They're inconsistent. Sometimes right. quarter to quarter. So what's the grade? Give me the, give me the letter grade. Yeah, I here. gave them a B plus. B plus. What'd Ooh. you give them? Quick. I gave us a B. You gave them a B. Yeah. Right. And hey, we played without the two bigs this weekend. We did not look very good. Fair enough. So. Let's move on to a team that is looking good, the Rustlers men's basketball team. Of course, the Rustlers men's volleyball team as well. Nine and three, first in the ACAC for men's volleyball, or men's basketball. Men's volleyball on the other side of that, three and nine, last in the ACAC North. What do you give it? Let's start with men's basketball. Yep. What's your grade? I got an A for Coach Thomas and his squad. Okay. Uh, I really like what I've seen. They returned a lot of guys. I think internally at Lakeland, we knew they were going to be strong this year. They're um, much stronger than they were last year. Yeah, and, and just when you have a lot of the core pieces back and those are older guys, you know you're going to have a chance to win a lot of those close games because you've been there before. Right. Um, they're struggling with a little bit of inconsistency, exactly. like shooting the ball sometimes, but that happens. I, I like their squad. They're nationally ranked right now. They're first in the north. Uh, I'm excited to see what they do in the second half. I went A-. minus. I went A minus okay. on this. Um, I see when I watch this team, and and I, I see a difference in in Sheree this year than I did last year. He seems energized. He seems uh, I just don't know how to describe it other than energized. He he, he right. seems like he's just he's enjoying it a lot more. Uh, and although that team lacks in size, they make up for an energy. Mm-hmm. Um, very energetic team. Um, they, 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 again, inconsistent. If yeah. they can shore that up defensively, very good. I think they're a, a defensively a nice step up from last year. Men's volleyball. Um, I will start with them. I gave them a D. Okay. The weird thing about this team is they're still within striking distance <laughs> of third place, yes. which is crazy. And all they need is to go on a roll. Their biggest problem is they have not won a road game since the 2015-2016 season, January 29, 2016 at Nate. They have not won a road game since that point. If they do not figure out how to win road games, they are not going to be successful. Yeah, Coach Dyer talks about that all the time. They're only good at home, which is not a good thing for a coach. You want your team to play well on the road when you have that adversity. Uh, I had a C- minus for them right now. Just because they are in the playoff hunt at 3-9, and nine, what I'm seeing as a coach is I'm seeing them in more five-game, four-game sets than last year. So they're around that area. It's just getting rid of those mistakes. A little bit of polish. Yeah. Just a little bit more polish, a little bit more focus from that team, uh, and, and they should be just fine. As Lance mentioned, the Toronto Argos are the 105th Grey Cup champions. We saw an interesting play call when Calgary took a shot deep to win the game. Lance, was this worse or better than the previous week's play call? Look, people are absolutely chastising Bo Levi Mitchell and they're hammering Dave Dickinson for this play call. The fact of the matter is, what are you going to do? It's second and whatever it was, you're on second down. And, and you are in a position to kick a field goal. I'm seeing people say they should have kicked a field goal. Look, it, if you're a coach and you're calling to p- kick a field goal on second down with, with uh, 20 seconds left on the clock, then you, sir, are the idiot because that is the wrong play call. What he did was right. He didn't throw it into double coverage because Matt Black came from out of nowhere to pick yes. that off. It was single coverage. And he had a, he had a jump on the defender. Yep. It, it just was underthrown a little bit, and Mac Black made an incredible play. It's the right call. It's the right call. You've got to go for a score. You get a score there, the game is over. See, and I agree with you. Rarity, I agree with you 100% on this, especially when you're it's typically a road game for them, right? Basically a road game. When you're on the road, you play for the win. You never play for a tie. I, you can't play for a tie. And, 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 and I didn't get, even mind the throw. Like, I thought the throw was okay. I thought he got bumped off the ball a little bit. Like A little bit. Yeah. Like, like, look, at the bottom line here is, if that ends up any other way other than an interception, that game's going to overtime. Yeah. They're going to get the ball, they're going to kick a field goal, it's going to overtime, and who knows what happens in overtime. Yeah. Uh, the fact that, that Matt Black made an incredible play to pick that, yeah. that's still the play you have to do. You've got to take a shot at the end zone 
in that situation. Well, I think a little of the play calling comes from the fact that they turned the ball over on what was it, the five yard line. So now you feel like we got to go out and win this game after the big turnover. Well, I mean, they, they, they got lucky a couple of times. I mean, uh, Levi Noel missed recovering a fumble like the 20 yard line because he tried <laughs> to pick it up and run with it instead of jumping on it. Um, you know, the turnover game went in favor of Calgary because it could have been way worse. Right. I believe they fumbled three times to Toronto's one on the very first kick of the game. Yeah. Uh, or sorry, very first kick back to Toronto after Calgary scored. Ar Armani Edwards fumbled it off the kick, got it back. But uh, it was a, like a grease pig out there. That it football. was a soap bar for sure. <laughs> yeah. It was like Even a bar of soap out there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you. I, I don't know how you. It's tough, right? I mean, yeah. and that's the thing is that weather can be an equalizer, and in that game, it was. As it pertains to that play, right play call, yeah. just not well executed by Bo Levi Mitchell. Toronto Argonauts had trouble putting bums in seats this season, and by trouble, it was fairly substantial trouble for most games just under 15,000 fans a game. However, can a Grey Cup win rejuvenate a fan base and rejuvenate a team that desperately needs it? Chris, are they going to put more bums in the seats now? I think they're going to put more bums in the seat. I don't think it's going to be significant, unfortunately. No. I, th I think they're going to capitalize on the momentum a little bit early next year, but then I think it's going to fade off as all the other sports, baseball, and soccer and everything starts to draw away people's attention. That would be my guess. What, what's your thoughts? Uh, my thought is that uh, same same thing in a way. There's no way that you're all of a sudden going to have a mass you know exodus of people trying to get get out of these other sports and right. into the Toronto Argonauts. It can't do anything but help. It no. cannot do anything but help. It is going to help by selling more season tickets. It's going to help by getting fans, that casual fans, into the stadium to watch games. This team is going to be better next year than it was this year. They're going to make improvements. Right. They went into the draft without a coach or a GM. <laughs> That's they're, a they're rough spot to be in. For sure it is. And they're <laughs> yeah. going to be better. They're going to be better for this. Um, so, you know, fans of the Toronto Argonauts can almost be rest assured they're going to watch a better team next year than what they saw this year. Well, and to win a great cup means you have a pretty good team. And especially, like we talked about it in the show, the run that they made at the end of the season, the playoff right. games, very exciting playoff games, Absolutely. both of the last two for them. So hopefully they continue to get those season ticket sales, which ultimately that's what drives all the CFL franchises. The, the other thing that's interesting, and although I don't think it really pertains to putting people in the stands, is that this is the first championship team at BMO Field. This yeah. is the first championship team at BMO Field. Other than the Toronto, Toronto Rock Lacrosse, the Toronto Argonauts are the first team to win multiple championships, let alone just one championship since the Jays did in 93. How, that's pretty significant. Side note, how was BMO Field? Pa like, was it vibrating from the soccer atmosphere with the roof and everything? When's this? At, at BMO Field, have you not been to a game? Yeah, sorry, before? last season yeah, I was yeah, at BMO. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been this year, yeah. obviously. Sorry, that, I should have prefaced that. Yeah, no, it's it's an amazing little stadium. Uh, you know, it's obviously the best venue for the Argonauts. Roger Center was a cave. Right. It's still a cave with the Blue Jays. Right. Um, it's a fantastic little stadium. When it's soccer, filled for soccer, it's chaos is the only way to describe it. It is unbelievable, the, the atmosphere there for soccer. But So the potential's there. For sure. The University of Tennessee football hired Greg Schiano as their head coach this past week, Yikes. but then they didn't. Lance, talk a little bit about how this took place and, and are we gonna see these types of incidents a little bit more often? Well, listen, I mean, the, the one thing we should talk about is was this fair to Greg Schiano? You know, there's a, there's a massive elephant in this room right now. It's a huge elephant in the room. And it's that Greg Schiano allegedly, and this is a massive allegedly, yep. did not report an incident of child rape that he apparently saw Greg Sa or, uh, Sandusky do in a shower yep. at Penn State when he was with Penn State. Now, allegedly because this is coming like third word of mouth. It was told to an <laughs> assistant coach that was then told to Mike McQuarrie who told other people. So there's no real proof of this. This is unfair to Shiano. He's not the guy who raped these kids. He's not Jerry Sandusky. He, he's, he's a guy who saw something. And did he report it or did he not? There's no real proof that he even saw anything. So this is unfair. You hired a guy and then you didn't hire him. Yeah. In the same day, basically. And that's where I have a problem. If, if there was proof, great. He never gets hired again. He never gets a job. He doesn't deserve to coach, right? If he saw that happen and didn't report it. I mean, this is, this is what happened with, with uh, head coach. This is what happened with the athletic director. Like Joe Paterno yeah. was fired, died essentially because he, he didn't coach the team anymore, but he should have been fired. Right. And I guess the fans, all of a sudden, this was mostly the fans started rallying against oh, the hire, so. right? So the university announces it, everything's all roses, and then the fans rally, and all of a sudden the, it's just done. Because the, the rally yeah. actually came out even before the university had said anything about it. 
Yeah, it, it came out long before that. Uh, I mean, they've got they've got a uh, an area in their university. It's called the Rock. That's essentially like a landmark in the university that said that he covered up. Shiano covered up child rape right. at Penn State. Like Which there's, but there's n it's an alleged thing. It's not. It's not. And don't get me wrong here. I'm pretty sure anyone watching this is, is understanding. We're not condoning what yes, happened at Penn State. Sure. I mean, obviously, but it's not fair to a guy that that really potentially had nothing to do with it. Yep. to treat him like this. Yeah, and, and he lost his family a lifestyle millions of dollars because of the alleged. Uh, it's just, it's, an, it's a complete disaster. Albert's on the other side loaded up and uh, we got some good stuff in there. You try and get it, boys. We're back and the gloves are still off. Still didn't get a voice back. It's crackling. Tweet. You might get a new pitch today. I might be going through puberty. Yeah, good for you. Tweet. Second time's a charm. Tweet. Second time. <laughs> here we go. Let's get it started here. Please do. At Sports Center, the win streak ends at 16. Streak snapped. And this, of course, is right after I predicted they would win, <laughs> yeah. what, 20, that's, 25 games? I believe that's why that one ended up first. <laughs> Shocking. 21 games. Who put this together? Hey, I don't know. There's mail. I don't know. <laughs> I will not take credit for this. Okay. So Corporal Matthews, I don't know if anyone follows Corporal Matthews. Uh, it's pretty funny, it's definitely worth a follow. Typically starts all his tweets with mother because he's you know, a soldier that right. he's writing home. This one's amazing. Our battle in the swamp took longer than expected, so referring to Florida. We unfortunately succumbed to Captain Luongo and his magnificent Draculesque hair. <laughs> it is truly breathtaking. The 18 people who came to watch seemed to really enjoy themselves. <laughs> <laughs> You've got true though. Dra Draculesque hair is honestly the best take I've heard in the last. That's few one weeks. of the best Luongo uh, comparisons oh, I've heard. Oh man, it's incredible. <laughs> oh my boy, at Joel Embiid. Yeah, I know you like Embiid. The, yeah, I love him a lot. The love in the city is different. Special connection we have. I really appreciate it. Hashtag the process. He's so city brotherly love, baby. Yeah, he's so good for NBA. Like I love his social media. I love how active he is on there. I mean, uh, at some point it's going to burn them. Let's think be of honest. where the Phillies have come from, though. Or yeah. the Phillies, pardon me. The, uh, the <laughs> well, 76ers. they're Philly. Yeah, they're they are Philly, Philly the 76ers. Yeah. Think of where they've come from. Yeah, they were terrible. They're going to be, they could be a, a, like a four or five seed. Uh, they, they, they may, the they're probably going to make the postseason. They could, they could make the second round. And possibly. they were hot garbage a couple of seasons and, ago. And their number one pick hasn't played all year. That's true. That's a good point. Um, all right, the score at the score. Byron Scott has, has some advice. For LeVar Ball, of course, this comes from LeVar Ball criticizing Lakers coaching, that they aren't coaching his son right, that he knows how to coach his son right. Of course, the quote is, shut up, stay put, and stay on the sidelines. We got this. Yeah, Byron Scott didn't have a great hey, record in coaching. So yeah, LeVar well, Ball needs to stay in his lane. He's got a lane. great record tweeting back at LeVar Ball. That's pretty solid. Yeah, well, Lonzo hasn't been so good. So He's been awful. He's yeah, been awful yeah. is what he's been. So good, not so good as... I'm trying to be nice. I'm a Lakers guy. I, I hate him. I can't stand watching him play. I'm no, a Lakers how can fan. you? I, I, it's awful. At Barstool Sports, the CFL Grey Cup, Grey Cup halftime show is the greatest spectacle on earth. And that was the great Shania Twain. The thing, that, the thing that's crazy about this to me, first of all, it's pretty cool that Barstool Sports is tweeting about yeah. this. But the thing that's crazy to me is, were they planning on pulling her into this? Because when, when we rolled up to the stadium before the game started, there wasn't any snow. There wasn't any snow on the field. Like when we got there... It was so. This it was, is what, like two hours before, hour. Before? Oh, an hour before the game it started, really? and it just was nuts. So, and it, it by the time game game time rolled around, it that field was covered. Canadian blizzard. It was amazing. But anyways, were they gonna roll her out there in a dog sled, whether <laughs> or not the <laughs> snow came? Like, I'm hoping that was Plan B. <laughs> I hope so too. Regardless, it was it, that was Canadian right there. No, no, it was You've fully Canadian, and that that created a lot of buzz, right? And rightfully yeah. so. It, it it should. It was. Uh, yeah, was, I was, was I was cool rocking out to her songs at home. Yeah, and it's uh, I think she did three songs and that was it. Yeah, not gonna lie, we were going for food when food. Shania Twain was mm. playing. Yeah, food, food, yeah, Good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can tell. It sounds like it. Chicken tenders and fries. <laughs> that's that's what I was doing. Okay, uh, TSNPR at TSNPR, and I love when people are always going on about uh, the Grey Cup. You know, it doesn't matter. Nobody in Canada likes the Grey Cup. 105th grade cup presented by Shaw grows by 10% to 4.3 million viewers on TSN and RDS. Yeah, it's a dying league. Hey, it's a dying league. that's mail. huge. Those are huge numbers. It's huge Especially numbers. Especially with the possibility of expansion coming in it's here. It's huge numbers. Well, listen, 
I'll tell you right now, we went to some of those Grey Cup parties that on Saturday night. Yeah. Um, might have stated a little late. There was a lot of representation from the Atlantic schooners. A lot of representation. I bet you they, I bet you they stayed out fairly there late. There was not one East sober coasters. guy representing the Atlantic schooners. <laughs> yeah. I'll say that right now. A lot of gargling, you know, trying to talk to people. Yeah. You couldn't understand what they were saying. They're good at what they do. Yeah, a lot of East Coast by, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Where are you to? At City News, City Toronto. Talk about bad timing. The bus photo bombs the Grey Cup champs. The <laughs> Toronto Argos returning home to Pearson Airport. It's amazing. How many times does this stuff happen? Like I don't. Well, look. At <laughs> How's that not planned, though? Well, it's got to be. It has to be. There's no way that you're focusing in on Ricky Ray coming down the thing <laughs> with the Grey Cup and that bus rolls in front. Hey, why don't you guys park on the other side? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Or just park Who's at the back of the plane. Yeah. Just move back a few feet. You've got mail. Uh, someone had somewhere to go. Is what happened. <laughs> Yeah, like the team. All right, we're sticking with Ricky Ray, Sportsnet at Sportsnet. Uh, will Ricky Ray return to the Argos next season? Listen, my bold prediction was that Ricky Ray is done. My bold prediction from last weekend, he's done regardless of the outcome. And now that they've won, he, he, he didn't indicate he was coming back. He didn't indicate that he was retiring, but it certainly sounded like it in a post-game interview with Arash Madani of Sportsnet. But at the team's rally Tuesday, pardon me, at last the team's year, rally on, thank you very much, at the team's rally on Tuesday, he made it sound like he might be back for another year or two. Tom Brady, man, he's he, going to play forever. Well, this, so this is interesting. Ricky Ray adopted more of a plant-based diet like Tom Brady. He's changed from weightlifting to more of stretching. So instead of putting yep. you know, a lot of pressure on muscles, he's stretching them out, which is helping him. Because at that age, you have to be limber. You have to be... You're old. Yeah, yeah, you you're got mail. Old it's easy basically. to get broke. Yeah, it is easy to get busted up. Well, good for him. <laughs> well, well, good for him. <laughs> <laughs> the, at the Raj 590, journalism's death continues. More newspaper closings. Very sad. sad. We no longer pay for true journalism by subscriptions or through advertising sponsorship. Everything is online and free, often produced by the people who do it as a hobby. We will pay a very hefty price for hashtag free. This is 100% true. And I mean, a lot of people go to Twitter to get, to get, a lot of silliness. I'm guilty of it. Yeah, I go on there too. and I log on to find some funny stuff, you know, like yeah. that's, that's silly. That isn't journalism. It's yep. not news. But, you know, and a lot of people complain about these cuts, you know, a lot, just regular public, yep. you hear complaining about these cuts. But, you know, I would ask those people, when was the last time you paid for journalism? Well, I think everyone expects everything for free now. That, that's the problem. And the journalism, it's, it's, it's a need, we need to have it. Like you need to get accurate articles. Look, I bought a subscription to The Athletic right. for a year, um, The Athletic Toronto for a year because it's great. It's good writing. It's, it's, and for me as, as a CFL fan, I get a lot of CFL content that really doesn't exist in other places. Right. So there's a guy dedicated to the Argos, Sean Fitzgerald, uh, which is, uh, he's a great writer and it's, it's excellent to read. But yeah, I mean, when was the last time a lot of people paid for journalism? They didn't, yeah. and they probably the won't. No. And un until they do, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna get second rate journalism yeah. from people, like as Roger Lajoie said, that are just- It's unfortunate. That are it's just doing it as a hobby. Steve Simmons, another good writer uh, out of Toronto, might add, at, St at Simmons Steve. From homeless to Grey Cup to home. The remarkable journey of Jermaine Gabriel, my column. Like, this is a crazy story. So this guy grew up in a, in a sketchy area of Toronto. I believe it was Wilson and Finch area. Um, and lived with a single mother who was very poor. Uh, got by in school at university by eating syrup sandwiches, which are essentially <sighs> pieces of bread with pancake syrup folded together when he couldn't eat with the team because he played football. Right. Eventually dropped out of the first school he went to because he couldn't pay tuition. Yeah and was, was actually drafted by the Toronto Argonauts. He got lucky, 17th overall. Um, but they were homeless for times. They lived in shelters. It's amazing to see someone that can come out of that environment and do what he did on he the field. He was in gangs. Yeah. He was involved in gang life. And he eventually just said, I don't want to be a hey, part of this anymore. Mail. And he tried to, make, you know, tried to make his life better. And now he's a great cup champion. That is an awesome story. 
At Saskatchewan Summer Games, oh, sorry, Saskatchewan Summer Games at SAS Games, we're thrilled to announce that the city of Lloyd will be hosting the 2020 Saskatchewan Games. That's good news. That's huge news, huge. That's great news. It, it, you know, more, more uh, exposure for the community, more exposure for the sporting community here yeah. in Lloydminster, which is excellent. I mean, it's, it's fantastic stuff. Especially at the youth level. I think that's the cool thing about the SAS right. Games. It's a younger I mean, level, and uh, yeah, it's really exciting for those kids. Yeah, and, and in a community like this, that's, that's the sporting culture here. Is, is youth youth sports right? right you see a ton of people who are interested in high school sports you know i've been a big advocate of lakeland wrestling sports it's excellent stuff um, which is a little bit more than youth i would say but you know even just watching those peewee kids play for a provincial football title was was hey, amazing there's that's, awesome stuff. Yeah. that's that's a fabric of, of lloyd minster sports community okay this is interesting dan o'toole so this is uh, dan o'toole from tsn at tsn o'toole let me get this straight at NHL plays zero night games, zero night games Super Bowl Sunday, zero games on American Thanksgiving, yet play games on Canadian Thanksgiving, and a Canadian NHL team is on the ice during the Grey Cup. Awesome. <laughs> Sarcasm is so thick. I'm gonna cut it. I had this talk with someone else. Why isn't it just blacked out? Like this is the CFL is a huge deal. It's a big deal. And those leaks can help each other out. Everyone would profit from it. The, the CFL has great viewership numbers as it is, but you know, the Grey Cup is a massive deal for Canada. Yeah, was anyone actually watching the hockey game? I don't there's, know. there's no way. T tell me who was playing in it. I don't know. I, I don't even have any idea. No clue. I was just looking for you in your little Argos t-shirt. We were on a lot. <laughs> We're back. You can keep your gloves on, but ours are off. Full predictions with Kinger. <laughs> I'm here with a voice. You want me to start? Sure, yeah, please. I would love it if you started. Okay. The Edmonton Oilers have been struggling this season. My prediction is that their head coach, Todd McLennan, will be traded before McClellan? the McClellan? Traded. Fired. Look, holy. They gosh. might trade Todd McClellan. Could they trade him for a D-man? Can you trade a coach for a demon? You probably could, actually. Okay, well, they'll trade him to free agency and hire someone else as a coach. They'll fire him is what you're talking about. That's what I was getting at, yeah. They'll fire him? Yeah. When? Uh, I'm going to say before January 1st. Wow, really? Yeah. He's got to go before the GM, right? Head coach, then the GM. Well, the I, GM I, would do it to save his butt. I think it's safe to Peter say that. Peter will fire Tom McClellan to save his. Yeah, you know, the Oilers what? played great last year, and now they're underachieving after overachieving last year, and now all the pressure's on them to do the same thing they did last did you season. See the, did you see the article that came out, Ke uh, Jordan Eberle ripping the, uh, the Edmonton sports media? I did not. Just, just nails and hands on the cross, like total crucifixion. That's was he not treated pretty well there? crucifixion a word, or is it crucifixion? Crucified. Total crucifixion, I believe it yeah, is. That yeah, that sounds Not better. crucifixion. With your voice, it sounds like you could dub over a movie saying that. Yeah, I'm thinking of, of it. Yeah. I'm thinking of it. I might, I might try and do a documentary with this voice before it goes away. BBC. <laughs> okay, uh, I originally had a bold prediction that one of the LA Rams or the Philadelphia Eagles will be in the Super Bowl. I'm changing that bold prediction to the Philadelphia Eagles will win the Super Bowl. They're a legit threat to win the Super Bowl. They're 10-1. and one. No. They, they are a legit threat. And yes, they are 10-1. and one. I think the Steelers and the Patriots. Well, then what did you say no for? They're not going to win the Super Bowl. I said no, they're not no, going to win are. the Super Bowl. That's a bold prediction. This, is, this is like last time when I told you your opinion was wrong. I, d I don't know if they're good enough. I don't know if they're going to be good enough in the playoffs. Well, of course you don't because they haven't played yet. They haven't played the playoffs yet. Yes, in, in You'll theory. find out when they get there. I really like what I see out of Pittsburgh. I really like what I'm seeing out of New England. I'm, I'm a little bit biased to that side, to the AFC, but... We will see. You could be right. You've been right What's before. What's incredible is that Carson Wentz was a Div 2 quarterback. <laughs> yeah. This guy came from North or South Dakota, I can't remember which one, as a Div 2 quarterback. Yep. Do you think the LA Rams are like, oh, we made a huge mistake there? I'll tell you what, the Eagles are pretty Not that happy. Jared Goff is bad. I'm no. just saying that. They could have done better, is what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, well, they could have had Wentz. Yeah. All right. Number two for me, speaking of could have done better. I'm going to stick with the firing trend. Jason Garrett will be fired at the end of the season, despite his owner saying that his job is safe and they want him as a long-term coach. I think this is the end of the road for, as many people call him, the clapper. Have you ever <laughs> watched him coach? 
Uh, I, all, I, nonstop. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh my goodness. So you don't think he's you don't think he's got it in on the last? No, I think he's done at the end of this year. I think they'll let him like stay till the end of the year. But well, if you're gonna fire a guy, why would you let him stay till the end of the year? I don't know. I would have fired him two weeks ago. But <laughs> I hate the Cowboys. That's me though. Well, because Jerry Jones is a guy who's easy to dislike. Right. Jerry Jones is so easy to hate. Yes. Same with the Cowboys. The whole franchise. Everything top down. <laughs> right through to the players. It's, you, yeah. ju- you just can't even like the players no. or the fans. None of nothing. them. Nothing. You prefer Bills Mafia fans? Over yeah, I would, w- I would way rather watch Buffalo Bills. Would you I'd prefer their fans? Yes. Their fans are absolutely, <laughs> honestly, just pieces of work. They are beauties. Like When I think of beauties, I think of Buffalo Bills fans. Like jumping on tables that are on fire, <laughs> setting themselves on fire. It's an East Coast right. thing. Let's, let's go local. Okay. Actually, I got a couple of locals in here. This is the first one. Okay. Uh, wrestlers men's volleyball mm-hmm. will win the ACAC championship. No, okay. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> I'm whoa. I'm just kidding. No, wrestlers men's volleyball will make the playoffs. Okay, I am with you on that one. I think they can. They're two games out right now. Uh, I think they've been in enough games that they could easily flip that around. There's a big log jam. There's a big yeah. log jam from third right through to the bottom. Yeah, it's it, like two top teams and then everyone's Yeah, and then just everyone else is separated by like four points. Yeah. Uh, and they're definitely in it. They just, like I said, just a little bit of polish. A little bit of polish, guys. Just a <laughs> tiny, tiny bit and you're there. Uh, yeah, I think they'll make the postseason for the first time in uh, uh, half a dozen years. I think that would have been since Curry Carlson was playing there. So, yeah, uh, seven years, I would okay, say. Okay, so yeah. there you go. Uh, okay, so I'm going to... They've got the team to do it. Let me just add, they have the team to do it. They have some pieces there for sure. They, they certainly do. Hopefully their Christmas break, lots of good training for them. They get everything ironed out. Yep, Second definitely. semester is a new season. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to parlay on that. Yes, please. Um, I think earlier in the year I said two wrestler teams could go undefeated. I think you laughed in my face. I do. Um, we have one, but we have a couple good teams. I think two teams from Lakeland College could make nationals this year in the court sports. So... Ooh. That could ultimately you break. Here? No, it could be us. It could be men's basketball. I think the women's volleyball team. We know we both expect them to be there. Right. Uh, it could also break Lakeland College's budget, but I think two teams have a shot of getting there, if not three. That's fascinating. The budget thing. So what do you do? You got you got two or three teams that could make a national appearance. Uh, you know we can't do it. We're gonna have to do some bagging. We some can't, bagging. We, we for can't fun. do it. <laughs> you guys are gonna need some good <laughs> video content. Um, okay, Sean Carlos Stanton. Will be a Yankee before the 2018 season begins. Uh, I kept hearing Dodgers is what I kept. Oh yeah, hearing. no, for sure. I mean, Dodgers are in the mix. I just the thing is, is the the Marlins can unload his massive contract. And massive is an understatement. Like it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's like nearly 300 million dollars. So you know they can unload that, but they're going to need something in return. You're not just going to get rid of a guy. You're going to need stuff in return. I just don't believe the Dodgers have the the necessary pieces that help the Marlins. But the Yankees do. The Yankees have a lot of good talent, got some good pieces in the farm. Um, and and I, think, I think a Yankees deal will get done before the season begins. I could see the Yankees dealing some of their young MLB talent. The For d- sure. If you're going straight prospects, I would say the Dodgers have way more depth in terms of straight prospects, especially the international prospects they have. Stanton in either of those unis, I don't like. I don't like the thought of it. And From what, what angle don't you like the thought I, of it? You just I, don't I, like it? No, I just... I hate the Yankees being a Canadian, right? I think we're all born to hate the Yankees. And I hate the fact that the Dodgers have enough pieces there. I don't think they need to add like a Stanton. I think their players are good enough as it is right now. I think they add like... Well, Jock Peterson played his way onto the bench at the end of the season. Basically. Right. He had a good, good postseason run, but he was terrible in the field. And they could use some fielding help in that. But mind you... And Puig was good in the playoffs. Puig was good. Are you going to get that out of Puig? On a consistent basis. I don't know what you're getting out of Puig no. on a consistent Who basis. Who knows what you're going to get out of that guy. So oddly enough, I'm on the Yankees as well for my next prediction. Okay. prediction. Last week, Japanese superstar Shui Otani was posted. <laughs> that's, the worst, that's the worst ever. Otani was posted last week. Shui. Shui. Otani. I love it. Carry on. Uh, was posted last week. So now every team in the MLB has a chance to bid on him. Uh, he came out with a list of like 10 things that he wants from each franchise. Everyone's in on him. I have this bad feeling he's going to be a Yankee. I think because of the culture piece and the money and because that's typically where a lot of superstars from the East land. What's your thoughts? Do you think he ends up there? Yeah, I, I, he's going to end up at a powerhouse team. And he's got to be an AL team because he wants to hit. He, yeah, he batted sure. 330 in the Japanese league last year. Like 330 with a 400 on base average. That's, that's impressive in any league. Yeah, for sure. 
Uh, he's going to end up with a power host team. It could be the Yankees. Real quick, uh, last one. Um, I'm way ahead of the game here, but uh, the Lloyd Con Burns will win the 2018 Alberta Bowl. I think they have enough Ooh. talent coming back that they're going to do it. I like it. Yeah. Another year under the belt, they're just going to be fine. That's awesome. Quarterback, two running backs. Uh, their, their middle line, linebacker is incredible. I appreciate it. If you can't score, you might as well drop the gloves. All right, we've got uh, a little bit of what we learned here. We've got some stuff we're going to talk about. Um, I feel like we're still Grey Cup heavy. Yes, still have to be. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, it's Canada's, Canada's game. You yeah, like how that you're Grey Cup heavy. You for like sure. how that came? I am Grey Cup heavy. <laughs> Real heavy. Oh, right boy, now. it was a wild time. Okay, uh, listen, I'll start here. Uh, what did we learn about Grey Cup weather? Uh, playing, playing football in the snow is not fun. Here, here's my thought. It's amazingly fun. Why it's fun to watch. <laughs> it's exciting because you don't know what's going to happen. Why can't we play the Grey Cup three weeks earlier? Could we start the season earlier, maybe compact the games Why? a little bit? Because, wh- do those guys want to be playing in the snow? Like is, I just think as an athlete, wouldn't you want prime conditions? Or do you want to say, hey, we won the Grey Cup. It was like a grease pig out there. There was 100 turnovers. The ball was all over the place. Or would I, you want to see the skill on I display? think to some extent they enjoy it. I think they, listen, let me tell you something that wild that happened pregame. So James Wilder Jr., the, the back for the Argos, came out of the tunnel with no shirt on. <laughs> and that was one thing, no shirt on. But he was all greased up and oiled up. So he's out there and he walked it. He must have taken a minute and a half to walk 20 steps. That's how slow he was walking out of the tunnel. Like, look at me. Like, that was basically <laughs> what he was doing. Amazing but stuff. Yeah, it's a- freezing cold, which is incredible and snowing. A535 basically all over his body. Uh, I think it was baby oil for sure. It was baby oil. All right. All right. So, what Lance, what did we learn from the 2017 Argonauts? Look, at, this is a team that a year ago in 2016 went 5 and 13. They were tied for the worst team in the CFL to a team that went 9-9 and and won the Grey Cup. And what we learned about this team is that coaching is a big deal. Coaching in the CFL is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting watching Mark Tressman compared to Dave Dickinson. Dave Dickinson's pregame approach is very in your face, very, you know, trying to amp his guys up. And Mark Tressman is is subdued, talking about talking about we, we love each other as a team and uh, you know, we've come this far, we just have to finish the battle. And, you know, he preaches a very kind of um, team first, uh, love your brothers mentality that, uh, that worked. And he, and he, I said this before, he's so well respected even in the NFL from his time there. I think, I, I, think I saw him give one fist pump in the whole game. I saw guy's him been just, to four great cups and won three of them. Yeah, and I think he said, we got it. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Okay, uh, <laughs> I had a bold prediction that Matt DeShane was going to score 30 points. 30 goals. Sorry, 30 goals. 30 with, goals with Ottawa. for the Ottawa Senators. Season's not over yet. Right. Uh, what have we learned about Matt DeShane? Okay, well, first I learned that he's probably not going to score 30 goals. I think he is who we thought he was. What does he have? Minus they are who we thought <laughs> they were. And we let him off the hook. He's, he's minus 13 with the Sens. What does he have? Three points in like yeah. 11 games yeah, or he's something been, like he's that? Yeah, he's been... Uh, not very good. Yeah, and I think that's like always the problem. When you trade for a guy that's a high-end talent, you hope that you're getting the best of that guy, and right now they are getting the They worst. are not getting the best of Matt Duchesne. They are not getting mediocre Matt Duchesne. They're getting no, the they're worst. No, they're, get, they're getting that. <laughs> Boy, you sure look at Kyle Turris and think, I wouldn't mind having that guy back <laughs> right about now. Well, that's the fun thing is we get to be told Mind we're wrong all the time. Right, and trades aren't, trades aren't something that you can say a team won or lost until long after the fact. Like, you can't sit there and say, oh, yeah, the Senators lost that one. You can say that right now, but yeah. it, it's, it's not applicable because it's going to take a long time, maybe even into next season before they really can kind of sort out, okay, yeah, maybe we didn't do so well on that trade, you know? It, yeah. it takes time. It takes a while for that to sort out. But right now it's not looking – it does not look like it's in – their favorite, that's for sure. No, no, okay. no. St- staying with the NHL, what have you learned so far about the NHL season, the 2017 uh, season? This is bizarre, and I never, ever thought I would be here saying this, but I think we've learned that the Winnipeg Jets, the Winnipeg Jets are for real. Yeah. Yeah. They're two points away from catching the St. Louis Blues. They're a really good hockey club. Real w- would anybody, would anybody have looked at this club and said, 
at 24 games or 25 games into the season, 24 games in the season, the Winnipeg Jets are going to be nearly at the top of the NHL? Not a lot. Not a lot of people would say that. Nobody. Like, they, they were a good team. They were a solid team. They're just not flashy. When you look at them, you're not like... Oh, you don't need to be flashy. You just yeah. need to win games. Yeah, and that's all it's about. And I think they got the depth. Lunch pale some, crew. Yeah, the leadership. It's kind of like suits Winnipeg, right? That's kind of Winnipeg's sure. mentality. So I, uh, I, I like what I've seen out of them, and uh, I hope they make a good run. Okay, Major League Baseball. I know you got a big, you got a big soft spot for Major League Baseball. Yes. What have we learned yes. from Major League Baseball's tampering and, and, and more specifically, punishment for tampering. Right. Uh, well, Atlanta Braves took it on the chin, my team. Big time. Uh, losing 12 prospects for tampering with the international free agents, the minor market, um, from 16-year-olds to 18-year-olds. I, I think what the MLB did is show that we're not going to take any collusion, any cheating at any level. And I think that's the only way that you solve this problem. Now, reading more into this, it seems like a lot of teams are doing this with their Puerto Rico and Dominican like fis facilities, right? Probably. So I think this is a message for the whole league. Unfortunately, it's my team that has to pay the price, but they cheated. So rightfully so, they lose a bunch of players, and a ton of guys got fired and lost their jobs for this. Do you think this happens under Bud Selig? I do not. That's a big deal. Do you? No. Yeah. No, I don't. I my guess is it was going on under Bud Selig for a long time. Oh, I, th I think it's one of those things, is it good for baseball as a whole or bad and i think the the moral line probably moves for sea league a little different than oh i believe it does yeah I so believe it does what did we learn lance from ottawa hosting the great cup listen let me first say that the ottawa senators did an incredible the ottawa senators the ottawa red blacks and the city of ottawa did an incredible job hosting the 105th great cup it was really well put together more impressive than that i think was that area around TD Place is outstanding. There's ample restaurants, there's ample bars, there's so much to do right around the stadium. And I've been to Commonwealth, I've been to, to McMahon, and I've been to BMO, and that does not exist. The closest thing to BMO is Liberty Village, which is you have to kind of go underneath the train tracks to get right. there, but there's nothing right at the stadium. What we learned is that Ottawa has nailed it with that area around TD Place. It's really well put together, man. That's awesome, especially with that many people that they could accommodate those people. Oh, for I'm food telling you, like drink. yeah, there were lineups for places, but endless amounts of choices for good food, not junk, like good food. Like we had some really great grub at a lot of these places, and kudos to the city of Ottawa. That is really well put together, and a lot of CFL cities can learn from that. And make it an atmosphere, make it a day out. Oh, you it's go. just incredible for a venue like that for, for the Great Cup. It just it doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better than that. I don't. Awesome. We're back, and the gloves are still off. Listen, the Grey Cup's a pretty big deal, so we're going to stick with that. Um, and we, we just want to do a little final take here. And, and I put a tweet out recently, and by recently I mean I did it Monday on the way home. Um, and I didn't, I, I, I'll, I'll read it, it's fine, I don't mind even reading it here. Um, I'm just going to find it. So basically, uh, the Toronto Argonauts have won a fairly substantial amount of Grey Cups since 1993, five to be exact. Um, so I tweeted out, the Toronto Argos is the only of Toronto's five major sports franchises, Raptors, Leafs, TFC, and Jays, to have won a single, let alone multiple, five championships since the Blue Jays' last one in 1993. Let that sink in a moment. Of course, that has garnered a lot of attention, um, to which, you know, I've got a lot of people f giving me feedback saying, well, it's only, a lot of guys, for some reason, are telling me it's only a six-team league. I'm not, I'm not sure what league they're watching, you know. So when I see that kind of stuff, when I see guys like, oh, you know, they're only playing in a six-team league, I immediately dismiss that comment. I can't, I can't take people like that seriously. Um, but so this guy, first of all, no other league has single-digit teams to compete against. Um, I like the Argos, but apples and oranges. So I said, so you think it's easier to win in the CFL? Ask Calgary, the league's best team for the last two years, how it feels about that. And he says, yes, it's absolutely easier to win in the CFL when compared to other North American sports. I disagree with that statement, and I know that you agree with it. Yes. Like, why do you think it's easier to win in the CFL? <laughs> it's not. It absolutely is not. The amount of teams has nothing to do with it. Okay, so your point, winning is winning. But the amount of teams does have everything to do with it. If, if 66... The games have to be played. For sure. 66% of the teams in the CFL make the playoffs. 
right? Sure. So immediately at the start of the season, you know you're going in the playoffs. No, no, no you don't. Because yeah, if you're one of the bottom three, okay. you're not going so in the playoffs. So one of the bottom three, right? In the NFL, how many teams are making the playoffs? There are six from each. So we're looking at 30, under 30% are making okay. the playoffs. So statistically, it's way harder to make the playoffs in the NFL than the CFL. It's way harder to win with those. Yeah, odds if you're just strictly looking at teams at the beginning of the season, saying, "Okay, we've got sure, 30 but teams." That's what you're looking at. It's hard to win in any league, regardless. But if you're just saying it's hard to win the CFL compared to other leagues, we, if there's a hundred, we're teams, talking about winning championships here. We're not talking about winning a playoff game. I don't, I don't care if if the New England Patriots win a playoff game and then lose the next, the next, right. the next week. I don't care. So it doesn't matter. Win a championship. But statistically, you're going to make the playoffs more and you're going to have more chances to win a championship, right? If you're a good team and there's only... But it doesn't mean it, it's easier to win that championship. Well, it does because I no, think the, ta the talents kind of group together in small if, numbers. If what you're saying is true, if what you're saying is that it's easier to win in the CFL, it would mean that we would not have a team that has not won a championship since 1990. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers w should have won a championship since 1990, and they haven't. So maybe they're just really poorly ran is the okay. problem. Or, or, or maybe the, they just they had a bad game against the Edmonton Eskimos because they were the second best team in the CFL this year. For sure, they could have a bad game, but they have exactly. more chances to be in that playoffs. Other teams in the NFL will never make That's the fine, playoffs. But they still have to win teams. two, maybe three games to win that championship. Right. You still have but, to win those games. But you have a better chance of being there even it if you don't deserve it. It doesn't mean it's easier to win in that scenario, it, though. I'm just looking at the stats. I'm not a smart guy, but in the NFL, you have a 3% chance of winning the, uh, the Super Bowl. In the CFL, That's you have 11% chance. That's strictly if you're doing chance. math on paper. But I know, but and games, I'm terrible at games math. Games aren't calculated by math on paper. Games aren't calculated by saying, hey, because there's 30 teams here and, you know, 29 get in, you have a good chance. Like, that's not how it works. The games have to be played. No, but your odds go up significantly each step right. of the way. Right, So you play, so the New England Patriots play three games into the year and Tom Brady has his knee blown out. Right. They still have a chance to get in because they probably won the first three games. Yeah, they, yeah, no, they're ch yeah, they have a chance to get in for sure. <laughs> right, they have a chance. They, they probably don't win it. But coming into the season, there's a handful of teams that know we're in straight rebuild mode, and there's other teams that say, you know what, we, we could do this. We're in the CFL. I think there's like four or five teams every year that think that they're going to win the Grey Cup. Do they not? Like legitimately. I don't know how you could. Look at how could you how could you go league. how could you roll into the 2018 season and think we're going to win the Grey Cup? How could you? The Calgary Stampeders were the best team in the league. They lost two games last year and they lost three this year. Tied one for both those seasons. They were the best team in the league for both years and and lost it essentially at the end of the game, both times. I, I think you're just taking out of the picture the sheer amount of, of teams, right? I know you don't I, I understand in the math. that there's a sheer amount. Of, I understand that there's more teams in these leagues. I get it. But that does not, it, you still have to win the games. Just because just because you were the best team the previous year doesn't mean you're automatically going to get in. You, you have to win. For sure. And I'm not saying it's easy to win any championship because you have to get in, you have to win. But if you're looking at sheer statistics, the guy that tweeted back at you and even for myself as a coach, I know that I have a way better chance of winning the ACAC if I'm only playing in a 14 league or if I'm playing in a 16 team league. Because in a 14 league, that means I'm going to be in that final four all the time. It's really hard to get into a final. So you're now, now we're into a four-team league. No, I'm just saying for CM7. example. CM7. Let's go on forever.